Jesus. Praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We thank you. We thank you, Father. What a salvation you granted us. We were lost. We were hopeless. We died in our sins. And yet, you did not give up on us. You planned a way for us to be alive again. Gave us a um, new birth. Giving us this born again experience in Christ. We thank you, Holy Spirit. It is, in fact, you who convicted us of our sinful nature, who convicted of, uh, us of our sin, thus helped us to see the truth as it is and find Christ in our lives. You convicted us of the salvation that is offered at the cross through Christ and the grace of God. And you helped us to believe in Jesus. You helped us to experience the joy of salvation. But you did not leave us there. In fact, you remained within us, continuing to nudge us every day in our walk with the Lord as you help us to walk with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for the blessed hope that we have that one day we'd be with the Father in heaven for eternity. And God, that we are only a sojourners in this world that this world is a temporary uh, place for us as we look forward to an eternity spent with you. We thank you for that privilege. We thank you. We thank you that while we are here on earth, that you are adding everything that we need every day. That God, the things that we dreamt of, desired, that anything that is good for us, you have helped us to um, um, uh, to have them graciously, God. And sometimes more than what we ask for, you have given to us. And each of those things that you've added into our lives has caused us to become better, to become more grateful to you, God. So we, are, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for our education. We thank you for our family. We thank you for our uh, you know, spouse. We thank you for our children. We thank you for uh, the skill set that you granted us. We thank you for the jobs that you've given us. We thank you for the promotions that you're granting us. We thank you that you're blessing the work of our hands. We thank you, God, that you're giving us an opportunity to come into your presence again and again together as the body of Christ, as a church. We thank you for that privilege. We thank you that, God, that you have given us the freedom to worship you. You have given us the freedom to, propag uh, to talk about you, to proclaim you. You have given us the freedom to, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, to come into your presence without any hesitancy. We thank you, God. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Not only you've given us uh, spiritual birth, you've given us uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 an opportunity to be spiritually transformed every day through the scriptures. We thank you for that. We thank you that, God, you give us each day a new day. Uh, um, uh, every new day is a second chance that you give us in order to make use of that day well so that we can bring glory to Christ. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. God, uh, no amount of uh, uh, offerings would ever uh, compensate your goodness, God. We'd never be a we would never be able to repay back. We'd never be able to express uh, complete gratitude uh, except that we offer ourselves completely to you, our lives to you, our hearts, our minds, our thoughts to you. And so this morning, we come into your presence with great gr gr gratitude, God. And so we pray that, God, as we look to you, we pray that you'd quiet us down, calm our spirits, help us to look to you, take control of our thoughts, speak into our lives, God, as you take control of every area of our lives. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for such a joy to come into your presence. What a joy it is to come into your presence. And this morning, as we look into your word, would you continue to minister to us just as you've been doing every day when we come to your presence? And so we come, we ask you, speak into our lives, God. We thank you for uh, this word of God that, um, um, you know, that, that was put together so that we may have life as we read it. We thank you for the words of Christ that are recorded by the gospel writers, we praise you, God, for all those faithful disciples who had gathered um, every um, um, uh, incident, event, and every teaching that Jesus taught, which are useful for us. 
And so I pray that God, as we meditate on them, uh, give us more understanding, in-depth understanding of your scripture so that our lives may be transformed. Not that we gain knowledge, but that we may become, um, you know, um, more like Christ. That our characters would be shaped, our behaviors would be shaped, our thought process would be shaped. Thank you. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning as we continue um, to study the parables of Jesus Christ, let's go to one of those parables that is one of the most fascinating parables um, uh, and more, most perplex, uh, one of the most perplexing parables that you would see in the scriptures coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 16, um, the first part of Luke chapter 16 is, uh, is, is a parable that Jesus taught that almost looks um, contrary to the character of Jesus Christ. It may, it may even sound like Jesus is propagating something that we, we usually don't associate Jesus with. Um, and so many, uh, many a people um, con uh, got confused as to what Jesus is actually teaching. And uh, sometimes we find it so difficult to um, you know, understand the scripture, this particular parable, that we, you know, um, we do usually avoid it and kind of skip over uh, this parable trying, try, in order to try and understand. Well, actually, if you look at parables, most of the parables are perplexing. Most of the parables seem um, extreme in one sense, um, um, confusing in another sense. It's, uh, it almost looks uh, paradoxical, you know, in what Jesus is trying to teach and what parable is trying to portray can sometimes look so completely opposite. Uh, and yet, all of them have, um, you know, a great teaching imbibed within them. And this is one of those parables. Um, it is aptly titled as the parable of the shrewd manager. Um, some, some uh, um, obviously, some uh, translations would have a um, parable of the unjust steward. Um, it's, it's funny because that statement itself is opposite, you know, the unjust steward itself is a total contrast. And we're going to look at that. It's, um, it's, it's an interesting parable. Um, while we are learning, if you have any prayer requests, do not hesitate to post them on the comment section. Um, either on, if you're watching on Facebook, please put it on the comment section. Or if you're watching on uh, YouTube, do use the chat box in order, um, you know, to, uh, to write your prayer requests. And we'd love for you, um, 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 you know, for you to write them so that we may be able to pray together uh, uh, for you at the end of today's learning. Let's look at it. It's a, it's a little bigger passage, but it kind of, um, it, it, the, the passage itself is both a, the parable and at the same time, the explanation to that parable and giving us insights into, um, you know, into, into that parable. Um, Luke chapter 16, verses 1. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain um, rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting the employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, uh, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll, have, that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you own? How much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill, quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Rich, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that, uh, that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when, you, when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. 
if you, uh, you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't, you, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of the heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Let me pause there. I think um, as you look at this, this particular parable, at once, as I told you, it can cause uh, you know, much purpose, perplexity. It may be considered uh, to be a difficult parable to interpret. Um, because uh, you, might, you, might, you, might, you are actually left wondering, is Jesus commanding the unjust steward for his dishonesty? Is that what Jesus was trying to teach there? Uh, you know, it, it almost sounds, while Jesus may not be teaching to be dishonest, it looks like he's commending the dishonesty of uh, the steward, uh, of this unjust steward manager. But the main point of this parable should be clear enough for us to, cons for us to see when we consider it carefully. Now, of course, as you see the parable itself, you would see um, a person who is a, who is a wasteful steward and a shrewd steward, a both. Now, the word steward, of course, means the manager, which, uh, you know, which, is the, which is the technical term that we use now. Stewardship is about managing something that's not yours. You are under somebody, you are uh, uh, given certain responsibilities, and you are supposed to manage those things. And when you manage them, you are doing stewardship. Now, there is a good stewardship, there is a bad stewardship. Apparently, this man is a bad steward. He was using what is master's and he was wasting it away. He was not being responsible for what was given to him. Um, and of course, it came to notice of the manager, uh, of the owner. So the master called him and asked him, hey, listen, I came to know that you are wasting what is given to you. Um, so I want you to prepare a report of all the things that you have done and I want you to give it to me and you're, you're fired anyway. Um, before you leave, give the report to me. That's the point. Basically, as a manager, he would probably be man managing and recording everything, having an inventory of the uh, master, having uh, uh, the inventory of the things in the house. Um, he knows where, what needs to be done, how they needs to be done, who does what, all the logistics involved, all the finances involved, all the material things involved. In all these things, obviously, he'll have a logbook that is maintaining, right? So what master is saying is, finish it and give it, give it to me, you're fired. So basically, he's given him um, um, you know, notice period after giving him the termination letter. So here is what he needs to do now. As a manager needs to go, he needs to prepare that report, give it to master. Now he knows he's already fired. There is no future for him. Now, obviously, there are a couple of ways he could have reacted to this. One. He, could, he didn't have to um, um, you know, give the report and he would say, now that he's fired me, what's the point of writing anything and just leave that place and walk away from the job. He could have done that. He's got this notice spirit that he needs to work on, but he didn't have to serve because he's the one who's terminated. And so he could uh, say, I effective immediately, I don't have to be here. I can just walk away. Anyway, I'm fired. Uh, master already told me that I'm fired. Um, or he could have done something else. He could have gathered as much as he can for himself, thinking that my master has fired me, the chances of me getting another job are pretty slim. Um, let me steal from my master, uh, take as much as he, I can, because he doesn't know how much he has, and I know everything, what, what, what are the loopholes, where all the money is, uh, where all the material things are. I know all the secrets of my master, so how about 
taking some of it and running away. You could have done that too. Um, most people would do that. Either they would quit or they would probably steal. But then Jesus gave a different dimension of this manager. He was a wasteful steward. Yes, he is. But then when, when he was faced with, faced with um, a difficult situation, which he knows um, is, a, is, a, is a situation that he cannot come out of, he became shrewd. He showed his shrewdness. The sh he thought to himself, what can I do now? Obviously, I cannot get another job. And I've, I've obviously, getting fired from this position simply means I will not get another position like this. The only positions that I might end up getting are the lower positions, um, um, things that are below my dignity. Obviously, I cannot go and dig and I, I know, do some labor work. Neither can I uh, go out and beg people. I'm too ashamed to, be, uh, to beg people. I'm too proud to go out and beg people, at, you know, ask money from others. So uh, I got to do something about my life. And as I told you, he's got the choice of stealing. But he decided, no, he would not do that. He decided something else. He says, uh, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure I have friends outside. So he calls all the people who owed money to the master and asks them, because he's the one who's keeping the record, right? Now he has to submit this record to the master. So that means he has the, now the opportunity to rewrite the record books. As the, um, uh, you know, um, um, the people who owe this master came, he then asked them, listen, how much do you owe the master? One person said 800 um, uh, you know, um, uh, gallons of oil, olive oil I'm supposed to pay back. He says, why don't you write down as 400? And to another person who asked him, how much do you owe to the master? He says, 1,000 bushels of the wheat. And he says, why don't you write it as 800 bushels of wheat? Um, now, you could look at that and say, he could do the botching of the record book even without calling any one of them. He could do that. Actually, in, if you wanted to steal, he could, he could do the rewriting of the record book, steal from them, and give the record back to, book to his master uh, after botching the record book. But he decided to do the botching anyway, but in a different way. And that is this, that he decided that I'm going to um, uh, you know, um, 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 do s uh, such a thing that the people who owed him would become grateful to what I am doing for them. So um, he cheats his master even more, yes. In this, uh, uh, you know, that's what you see. He um, uh, ingra ingratiates. He makes he, the debtors of the master become more grateful to him. And he put himself in the debtors' hearts uh, by lowering their debts. Now, um, uh, did he cut off completely what he was supposed to give to the master? Or did he do something else? Is a is a matter of discussion. I want to explain that a little bit to you. Now, for Jewish mind, uh, when somebody um, um, takes a loan from somebody else, you're not supposed to charge him interest. Usury is prohibited by the law of God. So obviously, if I am a Jew and I'm giving a debt to somebody, loan to somebody, I'm, suppo I'm not supposed to charge interest on them. Uh, scripturally, God teaches us not to take interest from other people when you loan somebody. You are eligible to give loan, you are eligible to receive that loan back, but not, don't, give, don't, don't give it on interest. That's what uh, the Bible teaches us. Anyway, this, this particular guy, um, uh, the, uh, you know, it could be possible, and this is what is happening. Uh, this, what, this is what might have happened in that, in that if you keep, the, keep yourself in the culture there that Jews found, circumvented that particular law by uh, doing something very interesting. And this is what they would do. A master who owns a lot of money um, would uh, appoint a manager under him. Now, the manager does not own anything the master owns. The master owns everything. The money of the master is put in the manager's hand, the steward's hand. Now, how Jews found a, um, um, an interesting way to give out money, to lend money and still gain profit out of that is this, that they put the steward and steward would be the one 
who would handle the money and he would go out giving out lending out the money of the master now when he lends out the money of the master he can charge interest on that according to the law the one who is lending out the money should not charge interest but here the manager is the one who is lending out the money of the master with interest now the master does not know how much interest the manager is charging all he knows is my money is going out and it may come back with a profit that's all he knows why would they do that it would not be in the record books why would they do that it's because they want to be having this plausible deniability i have never done interest i have never charged anybody for interest i don't know why uh, how much it is been charged um, i just know i gave money to my manager and the money came back to me that's all so in order to keep their record clean they would use managers to do their dirty work and you kind of know that it that's how normally even the um, you know the world works right um, we call them binamis right in our language so <clears throat> that's what the manager would do he would just take the master's money lend it out on a higher interest bring it back give it to the master as a profit so there you go it is common to do that so there is a possibility i'm just giving a benefit of doubt to the steward there is a possibility that the if the interest is removed from the debtors not only the debtors are happy but at the same time he himself is becoming a, a person of interest to the debtors a, a person to whom they are grateful to and they are becoming uh, they are in turn becoming indebted to him because he removed the um extra interest and then, so there is a possibility that this particular um manager called all the people who owed money to the master and uh, took away the interest there is a possibility of that now if um e uh, if that that um that is done meaning the interest is taken out but the principal is given back to the master even if master knows that he cannot do anything about it because obviously if he says where is my interest then he would be uh, under the law right he would be breaking the law so the obviously he cannot do anything about it if he gets a profit out of that it's great if he doesn't get and he gets his money back he still got his money back so really the master is in a predicament he neither can he scold the dishonest shrewd uh, manager um and uh, nor can he be stopped being admired by his shrewdness so that is the reaction of the master because he's like wow you you're a smart guy not that he approved his action obviously he's the one who's lost here he's the one who's losing the money here but then he thought man you're smart you just put me in a position neither can i go to police nor can i go to anybody nor can i scold you in public because obviously i need to maintain the plausible deniability part of it uh what an interesting uh, that is what jesus was trying to say the fascination the fascinating thing is jesus used the cultural context in order to bring out a principle saying this listen this guy is smart he is shrewd uh he is such a smart guy that he put his master at a place where the master could not react already the master fired him so obviously there is nothing else the master could do uh, neither can he complain about him the, so he thought the notice spirit that i am serving i would use it for my benefit so instead of stealing from his master what he did is he became um, uh, you know he put himself at a place where his the debtors of the master became debtor to him by losing the uh, interest on the other side by lose by you know um having a chance to not to pay back fully to the one who lent them so that is what jesus was trying to point out. i believe that's what jesus was trying to point out saying that this guy is smart that is why the rich man admired had to admire the dishonest steward he still dishonest mind you he still a crook he still made a loss to the master but master couldn't do anything and he had to admire the you know smartness shrewdness which he showed so as we look at this parable obviously you kind of recognize that it is about stewardship it is of course about shrewdness too 
And as, uh, as I began to look at and begin to study this, this parable, I, I, obviously I'm trying to figure out is what is Jesus actually trying to teach here? Is he talking about stewardship? Is he talking about shrewdness? What, what is he trying to teach us? Is he trying to ask us to be honest stewards? Or is he trying to be uh, asking us to do what um, you know, the, 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 you know, others are doing? Uh, because obviously the next statement of Jesus would be, the world knows how to do these things, but the children of God doesn't know this. That's what Jesus said, right? They don't know how to um, make use of what is given to them. Um, so is he trying to scold us, admonish us, uh, or, um, you know, uh, or is he trying to tell us something else in this, in this passage? Um, and then, of course, um, um, if uh, Jesus is trying to talk about shrewdness, by highlighting the shrewdness of the dishonest steward, what does it mean to be shrewd? That's probably one thing that we need to address. What was Jesus trying to teach us in order um, when, when he's asking all of us to be shrewd? And what does shrewdness have to do with the stewardship? Obviously, there is an interconnection between the stewardship and the shrewdness. The, uh, and, uh, and you're kind of, um, kind of trying to figure out w exactly what, uh, what, is, uh, what is that connection and uh, what good lessons that we can learn from this uh, parable. And that's what I want to focus on this, this morning. In fact, the whole explanation that Jesus gave after that would give us insights into how what shrewdness is, of course, and how shrewdness and stewardship are interconnected, and how can we become better stewards, uh, good stewards, not unjust, but good stewards with what God has given to us. So there you go. First of all, I think we all need to understand this. Stewardship is a result of shrewdness. Stewardship is a result of shrewdness. Good stewardship is a result of shrewdness. Bad stewardship is also a result of shrewdness. Both I want to focus on. I want to highlight that to you. So that's why instead of saying good or bad, I'm just simply saying shrewdness, stewardship is a good result, is a result of uh, shrewdness. Now, you could use shrewd actually means um, 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 two, two dimensions. It has a two dimensional meaning. Um, it, 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 it of course means um, being keenly aware of their surroundings uh, 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 with uh, our sh sharp intelligence, you know, sharp, uh, that means uh, being shrewd means being aware of everything that is around them, being aware of details, all details, sharp intelligence, quick thinking, that's what shrewdness actually means. It actually means to have a sense of practical, to have a sense of practical, what works, what doesn't work, that's the practical means, that's what it means. We call them realistic, right? We call some of those people, he's a very practical guy, man. Uh, you know, that, that's the idea. So shrewdness on one side can mean keen awareness, being aware of everything, and uh, being sharp at absorbing things, you know, being sharp at quickly adapting to the situation and changing the, you know, making quick decisions, sharp decisions, uh, most importantly, practical decisions. That's, that's one side of the shrewdness. Obviously, the other side of the shrewdness would be, um, uh, would, be, it would be the other one where you are looking at uh, being uh, um, um, tricky. Yeah, you know, you're using the same sharp mind in order to trick people, in order to deceive, um, using cunning practices. That's the idea. We call them the con men, right? They are shrewd. They are smart. They, they have a keen understanding of everything. They have, uh, they, they, you know, they, they, they absorb observe and absorb everything and use that to their advantage, obviously, the cunning practice of that. So you could be self-indulgent as a, as, a, uh, as a shrewd, bad steward, unjust steward, or you could use the same shrewdness to do something else. Uh, and that's what this, uh, this guy did. Um, so in the light of that understanding, it simply means this, if, being shrewd is having a practical, sense of practical, which means an awareness of what uh, is ultimately beneficial. An awareness of what is ultimately beneficial to me. That is being shrewd. So what Jesus is trying to point out in this entire parable is 
behave in this world in such a way, use the things of this world in such a way that ultimately it will become beneficial to you. Now, the word beneficial to you can mean two different ways. For, the, for anyone who does not have um, a, a salvation experience, uh, uh, does not have, uh, you know, uh, doesn't, is not in, in, in walk with God, for them, beneficial ultimately means what can I gain out of all this? And that's what this shrewd manager did. What is my benefit at the end of it? But um, for a Christian, the ultimate benefit of benefit is not how much I can gain here in this world, but how much I can store up in heaven. That's the ultimate gain for the Christian, for all of us. So what Jesus is pointing out is that guy thought of a benefit here in this world. You need to think of benefit ultimately, where you are actually going to be forever. So in the light of that, do whatever you need to do. Use your head in a practical way. That's what Jesus was trying to teach. So there you go. Shrewdness is uh, having a keen sense of practical, which means uh, awareness of what is ultimately beneficial. And so then you will then learn to be a good steward if you can focus on that, focus on the future, your future benefit, ultimate benefit. So good stewardship is the result of being keenly aware of what is ultimately my benefit and keeping that in mind and behaving today and using everything that is in hand today. That, um, I believe, in the parable is what Jesus is trying to teach, even through his explanation. Um, we come to that conclusion as we look at uh, all through the, uh, the next 12, verses 12, verses 10 to 15. You look at those five verses, you kind of figure out what Jesus was teaching through this um, parable. Here is the number one. The first thing that we learn, of course, I'm just using Jesus' words, just simply rephrasing them for our benefit. Make proper use of material riches by using them with a view to eternity. Make proper use of material blessings by using them, material riches, by using them with a view to eternity. That's what verses 9 uh, is all about. Jesus says, here's the lesson. That's the main lesson, right? Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone and they're going to go anyway, they will welcome you to an eternal home. They will welcome you to eternal home. Look at what this man has done. He used the money that a master owns actually, to which he is a steward. He used that money in a crooked way. Jesus is saying, this guy used what is not his masters to his benefit that he neither stole, so obviously he's not in a, he's not in a place where he broke the law, or uh, um, um, uh, he did not steal um, uh, where you know, he could have got caught and, uh, and be in a position of losing his livelihood completely. What he did, is that he used the master's loop where you know the 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 the, the you know the loop in that law uh, the the one the master is actually exploiting he's using that in order to gain for himself all he did is call his debtors and say listen can i take off the interest you pay back the original i'll all or i'll reduce the interest you pay back to the master um, and uh, you know it's a benefit now by doing so, the steward at that point of time is not in a place to gain anything. He's not taking money from them and he's saying, can I take off your interest? He's not taking anything from them. He's not demanding. He's not taking the bribe. He's not demanding anything from them. All he's doing is he's doing a favor to them. Now, the favor he's doing is, is actually uh, not his own to give, right? He's his master's. Uh, and so he's using the master's money to gain favor with these people. Why would he do that? Tomorrow, when he goes out of this job, and obviously he's, going, he's, he's, he's fired from his job, when he goes out onto the street, he will then have friends, friends all around him. All these people whose interest he cut down. Master's money. He didn't give that money. He didn't own that money. But he used the master's money 
in order to gain benefit with all these people who are outside. Now, when he goes outside, he doesn't have a job, but he has friends. Friends who may end up giving him a job, or friends who may end up giving benefits, friends who would be there grateful entire life, he's in a position where he can call for favors from anybody. Because he did a favor to them. Well, that's what Jesus is trying to say. This fellow used money to gain favor from people by doing benefit to them. He did not look at short returns. He looked at long-term returns. You see that difference? So that's what Jesus is trying to teach. That fellow knows. The people of this world know how to do that. And you will kind of realize that many people in this world who do not know Christ, who have become rich, um, gained a lot of friends in their personal lives. Ultimately, they are benefited out of this. But a temporary benefits, they got rid of them. They didn't look for profits when they began to invest in others because they know that I invest today on this person. Five years from now, 10 years from now, that guy will be in a position to give a favor to me. Now, sometimes this risk may not exactly work out. But if you can keep people under your favor, they will always uh, be at a place where they would be indebted to you. That was the lesson that Jesus was trying to point out and say, that guy knows how to use it. Christians need to know how to use it. How do you use it? Use it with all that you got, the money that you got, the, uh, the positions that you got, the influence that you got. Don't look at your benefit. Begin to use that material riches, material blessing to become a benefit to other people. To begin to give favors to other people. You will not have short-term returns. You will not have immediate returns from them. Don't look for immediate returns from them. Can I get some money back? Can I get a favor back right now? I'm doing this for you. Would you do this for me? Don't do that. Do it with a mindset that you become beneficial to them. And as you begin to do that, people will begin to become gravitated towards you, which will give you an opportunity to give gospel to them. It will put them at a place where they will have to listen to you because you chose to do favor for free. So there will be a lot of people in this world who could then be benefited out of you because of you who would receive a favor from you and would be in a position that they have to respond back in kind to you when you simply invite them to a place where they could be sowed with the gospel. And the goodness, the, the truth is this, uh, that if some of them come to Christ, they will be in eternity in heaven. And when you go to heaven, you, you will have all these friends there with you for eternity. From a Christian point of view. So my point is very simple. Use um, um, what um, God is giving um, for your benefit. Um, can, I, can I pause for a moment? Are we all live today? Are we live? Okay. I'm, because it doesn't look like as if we are live. I'm just asking. Good. If you're live, then can I go ahead? I'm not sure. I, I couldn't see anything here, so I pause for a moment. So that, that's the first lesson. Make proper use of um, uh, material riches to invest into the kingdom, to invest into other people. Uh, use them with a view to eternity. Uh, Paul talks about this, the same thing, um, um, writing, to the, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, he writes of the same thing. Uh, verses 17, he's talking um, to um, Timothy and uh, he's telling him how to teach people. So he's, he's teaching them um, and he says this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is unreliable, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. 
Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. By doing this, and listen to this, the ultimate benefit out of this. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. So they may experience true life. Do you see? I don't think it, I can get more clearer than this. Paul was extremely clear in telling, um, he's not saying don't be rich. Neither he's saying don't, don't make money. Neither he's saying, you know, don't, don't, don't do business. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't, you know, become wealthy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, use the wealth. First of all, remember, the wealth that you gain today won't be with you. It'll be gone. At some point, you will lose it. It's unreliable. But as long as you have them, you have the wealth and the material blessing, use it to bless others. You could have, you know, you could, you could be uh, better at using that uh, uh, blessing for the benefit of others because you're then storing up something else. First of all, you're gaining favor from the people who are here. Then all that you're doing for them will start storing up in heaven and uh, your good works will then be counted more. Your future is actually secured. You would experience life if you can do that now, today, today. Do it here with all the wealth that you've got. Okay? So make proper use of material riches by using them with a view to eternity. The second lesson that I've learned, and I, this is what Jesus is teaching, and that is this, between verses 10 to 12, he's teaching a very important lesson, and this is this. If you're unfaithful with others' things, if you're unfaithful with others' things, you will not receive what is due to yours, right? So that means, in the contrast, I, let me make it a positive statement. If you are faithful with others' things, you will be given what is yours. If you're faithful with others' things, you will be given what is yours. That's what Jesus said. Look at what he's saying, verses 10. If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in larger ones. So that's a statement. Because if you're faithful in small things, you'll be faithful in bigger things too. It's, a, it's an understanding. But if you're dishonest with small things, um, how can you be responsible with bigger things? Obviously, you can't be trusted with greater responsibilities because you're not faithful in small things. Okay, little things, uh, if, you, uh, if you are not good with small jobs that God, you know, your, your manager gives you, your boss gives you, if you're not faithful in that, you're not honest with that, then he would not naturally not give you greater responsibilities because he can't trust you, right? So Jesus is saying, if that is true, even in this world, then how, how, if you're untrustworthy with the worldly uh, possession that I gave you, these are little things in the sight of God. These are little things. I'll come to that a little later. These are little things. And he's saying, how can you be truly be responsible with greater riches of heaven? Why would God give you the riches of heaven when you are not faithful with the riches of the world that I gave you? And so he's saying, if you are not faithful with others' things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? You can't keep saying, God, I want my own things. I want my own things. I want my own things. Would you give me my own things? Why should I always be under somebody? And God probably is saying, listen, I can give you your things. The problem is you're not faithful with other things. Other people gave you something. You're not faithful with that. Why would I give you your own things? But if you're faithful with others' things, then I'll give you your own things. Make sense? By the way, this principle applies both here on the earth and in, um, uh, obviously, as Christians for eternity. Well, that's what Jesus taught. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, he actually looked at that parable a couple of days ago uh, of the talents, the distribution of the talents, and how the master was angry, not because this guy didn't make profit. The master is angry that this guy is not faithful with the little things did not make use of what is given to him. That is where the master was angry. He would have appreciated him if he put it to use and did not gain anything, but still used it. Master would have appreciated it. Thank you for using it. But you did not even use it. So as a Christian, remember this. The reason God is blessing you with jobs, finances, uh, adding material blessings to you is, of course, so that you may have 
uh, joy here on earth with the things that God gave you, but that is not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is that you will be smart enough to use the benefits that God is giving you to invest into others, to invest into the kingdom so that you can store up in heaven. If you are faithful with that, then you will have greater responsibilities, greater riches, things of your own. So there you go. That is what stewardship is all about. Being faithful in the things of others so that you may have things of your own. Make proper use of material riches by using them with eternity in view. If you are faithful with others' things, then you will be given what is yours. That's the second lesson. Now we go to the third lesson. And that is this in verses 13. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now listen, Jesus obviously is not, um, um, you know, calling money evil. What he's calling money, the, uh, what he's saying is, the love of the money is the evil part. Of course, uh, uh, Timothy, uh, writing to Timothy, Paul clarifies the same thought in um, the same chapter, chapter 6 of First Timothy, verses uh, 9 and 10. Um, um, it's interesting that this is what Paul says in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 6. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are tabbed, trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into rich uh, ruin and uh, de uh, destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. There you go. Um, um, Paul is saying money is not the problem. Love of the money is the problem. When you begin to seek after it, desire after it, go after it, it will lead you to ruin and destruction because you will then be driven away by desires, trapped by those desires, and you are stuck there, um, losing the real um, faith, uh, losing, um, uh, deviating from the truth, and uh, pursuing something that is false, and ultimately losing everything that you got. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, you cannot be devoted to money at the same time devoted to God. It doesn't work like that. You have to be devoted to God. You know, the second principle works better if you understand the third principle. The second principle was what? If you're faithful with others' things, you'll be given what is yours. The first principle was make proper use of material things uh, by using them in, uh, with the view of eternity. And the way for a Christian to use them is obviously to benefit of others, right? You would not be using it for the benefit of others if you love money. If your desire is accumulation of the money, then you'll not be able to do the first one and the second one. Both won't work. So generosity doesn't work. Faithfulness also doesn't work. You will not have generous, generous heart. You will not be faithful if you're a lover of money, if you're devoted to that. And so God is saying, Jesus is saying, listen, you can't have that kind of heart if you're a Christian. Specifically, if you're a believer, you can't call yourself a believer and still become self-indulgent. Still be focused on yourself. Still focus on gathering, gaining, accumulating of your money for yourself. So the principle is very simple. What you desire is what you will be devoted to. What you desire is what you will be devoted to. What Jesus is saying is, if you desire money, you'll be devoted to money. If you desire um, um, God, you will be devoted to God. Um, you can't be devoted to two things. What you desire is what you will seek. What you will be devoted to. Obviously, you will despise the other one. That's all it is. So if you're devoted to, devoted to God, you would despise the money. That you will not allow money to become your master. You will let God be the master. You will be the master of the money. That's the difference. What you desire is what you would be devoted to. And of course, finally, uh, the fourth principle is very simple. And that, that is, you know, talking to Pharisees, Verses 14 and 15, the Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, 
You like to appear righteous in public. But God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. What this world honors is detestable, de detestable in, the, in the sight of God. So, here is what I have learned. And I think we need to learn. The fourth thing is this. Things that we esteem highly can be detestable to God, can be despised by God. There are things that we esteem highly. For example, he's talking to Pharisees and he's saying, you guys act like righteous people because you want people to honor you. People may honor you because they, you may look like a righteous person, but I know your heart. So your actions, righteous they may look like, According to the law, they may look like, but I know your heart. People may look that and honor you, and that's what you're seeking, right? You think that is what I need in life, to be honored by people, to be esteemed highly by people, or there are certain things that you are looking at and calling it, oh, that's important, I need to be powerful, I need to have money, I need to have this, prestige, you know, all that. You're adding up to that, you're looking, looking your life through those lenses, and you're thinking these are important for you, and they don't really are important. They are not really important to God at all. What you esteem highly could be detestable to God. Uh, and so that's what Jesus taught them. He's saying, nah, you, you got it wrong. You were looking at the wrong place to be esteemed um, highly. But uh, truth is, that it's, it's not something that God is interested in. So that is the understanding that Jesus wanted, wants us to have in, through this parable. So basically, this is what he's saying. Listen, what you got is for you to use here for the benefit of others so that you may have everything there in heaven. If you're faithful with the other things, because the things that you have right now are not really yours, they are from God, and so therefore use them well, Therefore, you can be uh, receiving what is really yours, eternal life in the presence of God. And that's the true rich. And if you need to do that, you need to understand that your desire is the one that you will be devoted to. Whatever you are desiring today is what you would be devoted to. If, you're de if your desire is me, you'd be devoted to me. If your desire is money, you'd be devoted to that. And that would decide what kind of steward you would be, unjust steward, are the faithful one, one of those two. Uh, don't be an uh, uh, unjust steward because you think there are certain things that need to be, um, that, that would earn high esteem for me, that are highly esteemed in your sight. They are not really important to God. What is important to God is being faithful in what is given to you, little things that are given to you. That's more important. Learn from that, steward, that shrewd, unjust steward to become just faithful steward. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us. He's actually using the unjust man, unfaithful, dishonest man to tell us the contra, saying that don't be like him, but be like him. Don't become like him, but use the same kind of uh, methodology that he's following in order to gain his personal gain. Use the same methodology, same style of doing things in order for you to gain eternal blessing. He is using somebody else's money for his benefit. You use somebody else's blessing to be, be, to be a benefit to others so that you may be benefited ultimately. He is, uh, um, uh, you know, he is uh, um, 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 using his sharp intelligence to benefit for himself temporarily. I want you to use your sharp intelligence for what means, what matters in eternity. Use that, the same thing. Don't be unjust and dishonest. Be just and faithful on the other side so that you truly can gain true riches through your life, in your life. What a lesson it is. We got to learn this, all of us, um, from this unfaithful, unjust, dishonest servant so that we could be faithful, honest, diligent stewards of the, the, the blessings of the Lord. This morning, I do hope with all those interruptions, you, you're able to 
receive what God is trying to teach you. And I do hope that if you missed out some things, uh, do forgive us. Um, 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 you know, um, internet obviously is unreliable. Um, but I pray that you, you learned something today. And I pray that you would receive what is due to you this morning. And in the light of what you received today, uh, would you just commit yourself to this, that God, thank you for everything that you've given to me. Now that I know that all that I have is yours, help me to use it well for the benefit of others so that I may gather my treasure in heaven. Let me behave with the view of eternity. Let me move with the view of eternity. And so I pray and submit myself into your hands. I want to give you an opportunity to pray for yourself this morning and offer yourselves. And if there are any prayer requests, I'd pray. And I, I, I do see um, there are no prayer requests at this point of time in the comment section. But if I see a prayer request, I would pray for it. Uh, would you just, um, at this time, let me take this moment to pray with you and bless you. Father, I want to thank you, God, once again for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to pray together. Uh, to offer ourselves together to you. Would you kindly um, help us to learn from this, um, um, this wonderful parable, eternal truths, God, from this parable. So I pray that, God, each of us would be benefited by what we received today. And, and God, that we learn that we need to be faithful in little things, things of others, so that we may receive what is ours so that we may receive greater things. And it's only possible, God, when we understand eternal truths, that what we consider to be lasting, what we consider to be important, what we esteem with a high uh, esteem could be detestable to you, uh, could be things that we would lose instantly. In a, in a, it could be, uh, you know, those are the things that we, um, you know, really doesn't matter in eternity. What really matters is to be faithful to you, to be good steward of what is given to us, um, to become a blessing to others. And that's what matters in eternity. You taught us well, God. Thank you for this wonderful parable. May we, in the light of what we have learned today, respond to that in kind. We thank you, God, for, uh, for another opportunity that you gave us this morning. Uh, we pray for people who are in need. I pray that you would uh, meet those needs, physical needs, financial needs any needs at the workplace, uh, things that they require, um, of wisdom, understanding, patience for parents who require wisdom to rise up their children, for husband and wife who need love so that they can forgive each other and uh, you know, grow together. Uh, we pray for children who need um, yeah, um, um, wisdom in their studies. Um, we, we, pray for, um, uh, we pray for their spiritual growth. Um, we pray for young people who may be uh, uh, dealing with the questions of uh, life and eternity. I pray that you would speak into their lives. Uh, we pray for uh, those who are seeking for life partners. We pray for those who are married, who are looking for a blessing uh, in their marriage, um, a fruit uh, out of their marriage. I pray for all these needs. I pray that God, that uh, as a miraculous God, a, a God who does miracles, would you please intervene in their lives? And, uh, and meet their needs accordingly. We bless you, God. This morning, we um, um, you know, submit ourselves, um, all that we have, into your hands. We pray that we would make proper use of everything that you've given to us and remain faithful um, if it, um, here on this world in the light of eternity that we're going to be with you. Thank you for everyone who's joining. We continue to pray that you would uh, take control of everything um, that we do. We do it. Um, uh, help us to do it uh, so that we may bring glory to Christ. We commit the rest of the day and this weekend into your hands. Help us to uh, gather together to worship you, to thank God, to thank you for this wonderful nation and to pray for our nation together. Uh, uh, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I thank you for joining us today um, and uh, sticking with us in spite of the interruptions. I want to encourage you to share with people that this evening um, at the church, at the Dream Center, we will have um, um, you know, a time of worship together and prayer together. Uh, it's called Open Heaven, um, a time of worship and prayer. Uh, would you like to join us? Do join us. 
If you're in Hyderabad, do join us. If you're not in Hyderabad, and you know somebody in Hyderabad and around Nitec City, um, do invite them uh, to join us this evening. Um, uh, at 7 p.m. at Dream Center, we would worship, we would take time to pray for our nation, and, and of course, you know, as a people of God, we need to come together and to pray for our nation. So we want to mix that with worship and prayer. And so this evening, we will pray for that. And of course, tomorrow, uh, we will have our services. And tomorrow, um, you know, Lord willing, all of us would have both the services 9 and 11. And I pray that uh, God would grant us um, the opportunity to worship Him. So obviously, tomorrow morning at 7, we will not have a study. And we will continue to the study of the parables in the service itself. So you may learn, um, continue, so that we may continue to learn from the parables. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.